Okay, so, so big picture, what we're going to do in the next two papers is put together two different data sets. One is a wonderful Texas data set of county level data on closed paid med mal claims from 1984 that I've been exploiting in a series of papers uh, going back to about 2005. Uh, the second is a hospital inpatient uh, data set that tells you about bad things that happen to people in hospitals that are uh, preventable, and we're going to see whether there's a link between the two, and we'll have, in effect, as you see, two discrete projects coming out of combining these two data sets. Over to Xenon for the first one. Okay. So, <coughs> my name is Zenon Zabinski. I'm a uh, economics PhD student at Northwestern. Um, so, a common argument in favor of uh, tort reform or medical malpractice reform is that medical malpractice claims are largely random events and they don't really relate to uh, the quality of health care. Um, however, uh, so we want to pursue that question. To what degree are med mal claims random and to what degree are they associated with poor care quality? Um, this leads us to address another question also which can hospitals reduce their uh, medical malpractice risk by improving care quality and by how much? On the second question, we still have some work left to do at this point in our research. Uh, so the question we ask is, what is the association between med mal claims and the hospital quality? And to answer this question, obviously, we need to measure the hospital quality. The measure we use are these patient safety indicators, which are developed by heart, which are basically counts of uh, preventable adverse events that occur in hospitals. Uh, we also take a look at uh, are these are PSI good proxies for uh, overall uh, quality of care in hospitals. So the paper that's most closely related to what uh, we're doing is the study by Greenberg and others. Um, they find a positive association between open memo claims and the total number of PSIs in California. We're, based, we're using very similar data in both of our studies, but our methodology is slightly different. Uh, but nevertheless, we have broadly similar results. Um, another related paper is by Stutter and Mello uh, and others mm -hmm. that finds that 60% of med mal claims involve probable uh, medical error. Um, so they use different data, and it's not clear to what extent this medical error is directly related to the hospital quality. So. Because of data availability, we focus our study on Texas. So um, using Texas hospital discharge data, we calculate PSI going back to 1999. Uh, we also have uh, insurance claim data going back to 1988. And so this data includes all closed med mal claims with payouts over $10,000. We know the county and year of the injury for each claim, but not the defendant identities, not the physician identities, not the hospital identities. So all of our analysis is at the county level. Um, so we begin our analysis in 1999, and we think that uh, PSI will be most closely related to the, the year in which the injury occurred. Uh, but because we have data on closed med mal claims, most of the injuries that occurred after 2005 don't show up in our data set yet. So uh, we're only going to go through 2005. So in the end, we have a sample of about 5,000 paid med mal claims. Uh, 19 million possible discharges, which include 350,000 PSIs. And our analysis is limited to Texas counties with a positive number of hospital discharges because um, not all Texas counties have a uh, uh, large enough hospitals. We're already hospitals. Yes. All right. <laughs> so, so there are 18 patient safety indicators that ARC defines. Uh, so, like I said, there are preventable adverse events, and these are intended to provide measures of uh, hospital quality. Um, ARC provides criteria not only for identifying the specific adverse events that occur, but also which patients were at risk for each of the PSI, given um, what they're admitted for. And uh, one of the, we dropped PSI 16 from our analysis because the frequency is just too low in our data. Um, so here's a list of the, of the PSI that we're using for our, our analysis. Uh, so it kind of gives you an idea of the type of events that we're looking at. Um, the thing I wanted to point out on this table is that there's quite a bit of uh, variation 
in the frequency of PSI uh, across PSI within counties, but also there's quite a bit of variation in PSI frequency uh, within county or across counties within PSI. Um, so this will be important when it comes to aggregating uh, the PSI for our pool measure of hospital quality. So uh, the first step that we're going to do is we're going to construct our measures of PSI and uh, med mal risk. And to do this, what we do is for each county, we calculate the expected number of uh, PSIs and medical malpractice claims given the number of cases at risk in that county. So once we have the expected number, we compare it to the amount that we uh, observe um, in the data. And then we can calculate a residual that is not explained by the number of cases at risk. If you have a positive residual, that means we have a greater uh, number of mental claims or a PSI than expected. And given those, we can formulate a hypothesis that we uh, that the residual PSIs will be positively correlated with residual mental claims. Um, so to construct the PSI measure, what we do is we we're in this OLS regression where we basically regress the number of PSI J uh, in each county year on uh, the number of cases at risk for PSI J. And uh, when we run that regression, the error term that is unexplained by the cases at risk will be our residual measure of PSI. Um, so after running that regression for each of the uh, 17 PSI that we're using, um, we end up with the residual measure for each PSI, and we want to pull those together in order to construct an overall measure of possible quality. So because of the variation in frequency in PSI, we don't want to necessarily weight the high frequency PSI more. So what we do is we normalize the, our, the residual measures to mean zero standard deviation across counting years, and then we sum them together and we normalize them in order to obtain our final uh, residual PSI measure. In constructing our uh, med mal risk measure, uh, we use a very similar approach. The only difference is, is that on the right-hand side of our regression, we include the cases at risk for all of the uh, different PSI separately because there's no reason um, for us to favor uh, one the cases at risk for a particular PSI over another. And um, so once again, the, the error term, the, the portion that's not explained by cases at risk becomes our residual measure of minimal risk, and we normalize like before in order to get our final uh, residual measure of uh, minimal risk. Now, we don't. There's no reason to believe that the PSI that we count are the ones that people are suing for in uh, our meta data, right? Um, instead, PSI are meant to serve as a proxy for some sort of underlying level of uh, healthcare quality. Is this a good proxy? Well, we have some evidence that it might be. So this is a table that shows the correlation uh, of the residual PSI measures uh, across PSIs. And as you can see, for the most part, they are highly correlated. The exceptions are PSIs 3 and 15. So let's take a look at, at an example. PSI 7 is CLABSI, and that's correlated with um, PSI 17, uh, which is birth trauma, right? These are two seemingly very different types of adverse events, but they're correlated, so each one might indicate something about the underlying uh, level of hospital quality. So once we have more... What's yes, CLABG? Uh, central line associated uh, bloodstream infection. So, um, so once we have our residual measures of uh, medical malpractice and PSI, we can we can look for a correlation between the two. So in our, our first regression is this pooled OLS regression where we regress the um, the med mal measure on our PSI measure, demographic controls and period effects. And uh, when we do that, and we partial out the uh, year effects and the demographic effects, we Come, uh, we get this relationship between the res residual uh, mental claims on the y-axis and our full PSI measure on the x-axis. So there appears to be a positive relationship and it is statistically significant. Now, one thing we might worry about is that there's some sort of 
unobserved county level uh, county level effects that are correlated both with medical malpractice risk and KSI, and uh, that might generate a spurious correlation between the two. So in order to control for that, we also uh, consider random and fixed effects models, where the only difference from the previous equation is that now we have that UI, which um, which is going to be a county-specific effect. And uh, the difference between the, uh, the random effect and the fixed effects model is that the random effects model requires an additional assumption that the county effect UI is not correlated with any of the other regressors in the model. So the assumptions are stronger. Um, so here, here's a table that shows the results for all of our three different regression specifications. So as you can see, for pool though less and random effects, we have uh, positive and highly significant uh, correlations between uh, our pool three side measure and our Medmoc range measure. Um, when we only consider smaller counties, less than the medium number of discharges, or greater than the number of medium discharges, the results hold up. So this doesn't seem to be a result that's being driven by county size necessarily. Um, Unfortunately, we lose statistical significance in our fixed effect specification. The correlations are still positive in the data, but they are statistically significant, and we think that the reason for, for that might be because we're dealing with a fairly short time series. The within county variation it, uh, might not be enough in order to generate statistical significance. So, uh, from that, overall, we find evidence that medmal claims are positively associated with uh, measures of hospital quality. Uh, this suggests that hospitals can reduce uh, medmal litigation risk by improving uh, patient safety. It also suggests that medmal itself might provide incentives for hospitals to improve quality. Um, a paper by Melinda Stutter uh, suggests that other incentives are weak, uh, other financial incentives are weak. Um, Next steps for us is that we would like to extend. Um, next step for us is that we would like to extend the time series for our analysis um, in order to by using additional data, which hopefully will strengthen our fixed effects results. We also have uh, Menmount data from Florida and Illinois, which uh, we'd like to apply the same methodology to see if we can obtain similar results. So policy implications. So medmal reform may reduce quality without reducing uh, the, the reducing, uh, cost of health care. Uh, that said, at best, medmal liability is uh, at best an imperfect spur for hospitals improving quality. So how can we do better on quality? Um, it seems to us that some sort of systems approach is needed where there are structures in place that make it difficult for healthcare providers to uh, make errors um, or make mistakes, right? What we have in mind is commercial aviation. <laughs> Federal regulation makes it very difficult for pilots to make mistakes, but the same sort of structure doesn't exist in healthcare. And that seems to indicate that there's some sort of role for public health um, in providing that structure. Oops. So who might be interested in, in our study? Uh, people interested in healthcare reform, or in medical reform, uh, policymakers interested in improving health quality, hospital administrators, uh, how do we reach them? We'd like to hear from you about that.